Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be covering section 16.3, the second and third laws of thermodynamics. We're going to state and explain the second and third laws of thermodynamics, and we're going to learn how to calculate entropy changes for phase transitions and a chemical reactions under standard conditions. So, <coughs> a lot of times we've noticed that processes that involve the increase in entropy of the system are, are spontaneous. Um, but this isn't always true. There are times when the system's entropy increases, but the reaction still is not spontaneous. And the reason for that is that we actually have to consider something outside of just the system that we're studying. Okay, we also have to think about the, uh, the effect that that process had on its surroundings. All right. And together, by considering both the system and the surroundings, we can determine the change of entropy of the entire universe. Okay, and this is really what is going to determine whether or not a uh, process is spontaneous or not. So, to illustrate this, we're going to start with uh, three possible outcomes of the process of heat flow between two objects. Um, one is going to be the system, and one is going to be the surroundings. And we're carefully choosing these three scenarios here. Okay, so the first one is uh, we have the objects that are at different temperatures, right? So our system, for instance, is hotter than our surroundings. And we know that heat is going to flow from the hotter to the cooler object, and that this is always spontaneous, okay? There's never a situation where one just stays hotter and the other one stays cooler. If they're in thermal contact, we're always going to see heat move from the hotter to the cooler object. The second scenario are the objects are at different temperature, okay? And heat flows from the cooler to the hotter object, which is even a weird thing to even say, okay? This never occurs spontaneously. So we never see a situation where I have like a hot metal uh, rod and I stick it next to a cold metal rod and the cold metal rod gets colder and the hot metal rod gets hotter. That never happens, right? And the third scenario is the objects are at essentially the same temperature. So the temperature of the system is approximately equal to the temperature of the surroundings. And what this means is that the system is at equilibrium, right? We might see energy transfer between them still, but we're not going to see any change in the temperature, right? We're going to have just as much moving from one rod to the other as moving from the, the first. Yeah. We might still see heat moving between the rods, but the net change will be zero. Okay. So let's think about the math behind outcome one, all right? We're going to designate the hotter object as the system, all right? And we're going to designate the other object as the surroundings. So under this uh, system here, right, we have the reversible heat that was lost by the system, but lost by our hot object, is going to have a negative sign. This is part of our convention for talking about heat. So it lost heat, it's going to have this negative sign. All that heat that it lost went to the other object, okay, and it gained heat, and so it has a positive sign here, right? So we've set up a system where these are going to oppose each other in our sum here, right? This guy's going to be negative. This guy's going to be positive. We need to assess, is this guy more negative than this guy? Or is this guy more positive than this guy? All right. So the first thing we need to recognize is that Q rev are equal in each one. All right. So this guy is the same as this guy. They would cancel each other out in this sum if that's all we were considering was just uh, the Q rev values. But we don't have that. We have the temperature of the systems and the surroundings here. Remember that this guy is the hot one, right? So T cis is larger than T surroundings. That means that because T th this value and this value is the same and T cis is larger, this whole ratio here is going to have a smaller magnitude, okay? And this whole ratio here is going to have a larger magnitude. 
meaning that the entropy change for the surroundings is more positive then the entropy change of the system is negative and when we sum them together the overall change in entropy for the universe increased it's greater than one we could play the exact same game for outcome two okay now what we have is the idea that this guy is going to be the positive term and this guy is going to be the negative term but again this guy has a lower uh, value than this guy does and therefore the sign of delta s universe is going to be different it's going to be negative in this case because we've swapped these signs we've swapped we're going to wind up swapping the sign of delta s negative or delta s universe um, and this leads us to uh, the conclusion that this process involves a decrease in the entropy of the universe. All right. And this does not happen, which is why outcome two does not happen. All right. The entropy of the universe is always going to increase. If we look at outcome three, the objects are at essentially the same temperature and these two terms are essentially equal to one another and the entropy of the universe remains constant, which is a viable outcome. OK, uh, I just said that the entropy of the universe is always going to uh, increase. That's a little bit of a misnomer. It's just never going to decrease. All right. It can remain the same. So there's our edge case for that when we have equilibrium systems. This leads us to the second law of, of, of thermodynamics. All spontaneous changes cause an increase in the entropy of the universe. Um, so delta S universe is positive. We're going to have a spontaneous reaction. Delta S universe is uh, negative. It's non-spontaneous. Okay, we're going to have to input energy in order to make that happen. All right, and delta S universe is equal to zero. We're at equilibrium. We're not going to see any net change in any one direction. Uh, I want to introduce a convenient approximations. These have been really helpful to us this term. All right. Um, and basically, determining the reversible heat transferred can be practically very difficult. All right. Not all the heat that is transferred is reversible heat. OK. Uh, so and determining which of the heat is reversible and what isn't is it can be practically impossible. Um, but however, because the surroundings usually represents a huge thermal sink and the heat transferred from or to the surroundings uh, the heat transferred from or to the surroundings can all be considered reversible so basically because the amount of heat that's being transferred from or to the surroundings is small in comparison to all the overall heat that is in this huge thing that we're calling the surroundings everything that's not in our system okay then we can call that heat that's uh, transferred the reversible heat. And we can just use this heat directly as the reversible heat in our equation. And it allows us to kind of simplify this a bit with values that we can directly measure. The, the heat gained or lost by the surroundings and the temperature of the surroundings. So let's talk a bit about the third law of thermodynamics. So consider the entropy of a pure, perfectly crystalline solid at absolute zero. OK. This system would have zero kinetic energy. All right. All of the particles would be perfectly packed together and at absolute zero, they would even stop vibrating. All right. That would mean that there would be only only one possible microstate for this system. All right, meaning that the entropy of that system would be exactly zero. This is what we call a limiting condition. We're imagining a scenario at the absolute limits of what we're 
talking about here, the case where we have entropy is equal to zero for a system. And it represents the third law of thermodynamics. The entropy of a pure, perfect crystalline substance at zero K is zero. Now what this allows us to do is gives us a starting point for talking about how we're going to compare entropies and what we can do uh, and being able to define something called the standard entropies, all right? Where we have zero entropy is a value at a certain temperature, and then we can calculate all the entropy that was added from that as we go along. Um, and basically we're able to do that through careful calorimetric, uh, and we talked about calorimetry in our thermochemistry section, measurements that can be made to determine the temperature dependence of a substance entropy and to derive absolute entropy values under specific conditions. All right. So if we know how the temp how the uh, en entropy is going to change with temperature, then that means that we can predict the entropy that a system is going to have at uh, any temperature. Standard entropies are for one mole of substance under standard conditions, a pressure of one bar and a temperature of 298.15 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius. So the conclusion of this statement is that we can look up standard entropy values for substances at these conditions, our standard conditions, just like we did enthalpy before. And we can use the same sort of uh, thing that we did with like Hess's law to calculate the enthalpy change of a, a reaction with entropy. So I can go to the table in the back of the book. I can look up the standard entropy values. I'm going to have the sum of all of their products weighted by the coefficient of their uh, and from the chemical reaction minus the sum of all of the reactants weighted by their coefficients. All right. So an example here would be if I had this reaction right here, I'm going to start with the products over here. So I'm going to look up the standard enthalpy for C, the standard enthalpy for D. I'm going to multiply those by their coefficients. I'm going to sum them together and that becomes a one whole term right here. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the reactants. I'm going to have the entropy of A, the standard entropy of B, I'm going to multiply them by their coefficients. I'm going to sum these all together. And this is going to be one whole term here. And that is actually how I suggest that you guys do this. Okay. Calculate this whole term here. Calculate this whole term here. All right. And then you subtract those terms from one another. And we can see what the entropy change is for the overall reaction. You might be wondering where we're going to find our standard enthalpies. I have, they are well known. We can look them up all over the place, but I have uh, only used the ones that are in Appendix G in the back of our textbook. Uh, there is a graphic here for some of the more common ones that you might see used quite a bit in the homework. Um, but don't forget that these values are only valid at standard temperatures and pressures. So, uh, you know, you do have to have that caveat if you're going to use these. So pay attention to the language in any one of the problems to make sure that you can uh, calculate these standard values.